the next we move on to the next talk uh, why to give endocarditis prophylaxis by dr kuruji shanmugam murudachalam who is a senior consultant anesthetist and introductory training trainee trainer from the prince charles hospital brisbane australia thank you good afternoon i think it's uh, nearly lunch time you'll all be tired it's it's a refresher course let's go to the basics of a uh, medical school training i've got four pictures of uh, the clinical stigmata of endocarditis and they are labeled according to the picture a b c and d if you can find the correct arrangement there and what it is it 1 2 3 or 4 please okay so it is d is the correct one these are the oscillus nodes these are the subconjunctival hemorrhage this is the genuine genuine lesions and then you have the splinter hemorrhage is there okay so what are we talking about we're talking about prophylaxis against endocarditis is it routinely needed for all these patients why is that because it is an observational study which dates back to the early 20th century and there is no good clinical evidence to continue and there have been a lot of changes since then so what we're going to do see today is the incidence how we're going to diagnose it and how it presents what is the role of echocardiography the new recommendations and the special clinical situations we need to really look into and follow what it says is in the australian literature with the infective endocarditis the incidence is 1 in 14 million and in the normal population and in patients who are high cardiac risk factors it is 1 in 95000 what it comes to say is treating any routine patients for infective endocarditis the number need to treat is very high but the diagnosis is very important because it's got high incidence morbidity mortality as you can see that the mortality rate goes up to 20% and five year mortality is 40% and not only that this also results in the patients getting back to work and also the cost implications to the patient and to the community and to the hospital and one out of the two patients admitted with infective endocarditis need surgery and result in complications and delayed hospitalization and recovery so how does it normally presents or generally presents with a new regurgitant murmur with embolic events which you had seen the stigmatas there it can present with sepsis or unknown fever so these are all the immunological and vascular complications of infective endocarditis embolizing to the peripheral vessels how are we going to diagnose it so this group of people in 1977 they relied mostly on the pathological criteria because then that was the only thing they could use to diagnose these patients at post mortem but they didn't have many clinical signs and symptoms to in incorporate into this diagnosis and managing and treating then then later in 1980s clinical science was included to emphasize and also to make it easy for the clinicians to diagnose and treat and save a valuable life but this was not enough because it wasn't validated so then a group of investigators from duke university sat together and designed and included the echocardiography along with the clinical science and diagnosis and used the criteria the criteria is included three major criteria namely the positive blood cultures new valvular involvement positive echocardiographic lesions because the echocardiography was coming into place and also getting being used routinely and the minor criteria has been listed here based on these the diagnostic criteria is this true or false one major criteria and two minor criteria how many of you say that's true 
How many of us say it's false? It's false. You need two major criteria, or one major criteria and three minor criteria, or all the five minor criteria has been mentioned earlier. Or it's possible infective endocarditis if there's one major criteria and a minor criteria, or three minor criteria alone. So this is, the histological diagnosis is very important and it's the gold standard for diagnosing endocarditis. That's why initially, when the group of uh, investigators looked into the uh, diagnosis based and treated in infective endocarditis on this. So this is a bioprosthetic aortic valve that is seen from the ventricular side, that is seen from the atrial side, and you see the polymorphonuclear infiltrations and splitting of your collagens here. And this is a mitral valve endocarditis with the collagens and polymorphonuclear inclusions and these uh, uh, infective lesions there. This is another picture of mitral valve endocarditis. That is a morbid anatomy. That is a clinical anatomy that's looked from the ventricular side. You can see the endocarditis, the organs being stuck to the valves. From there, this is another morbid picture of aortic valve abscess there. And that is the aortic valve endocarditis, a native valve. And that is the 3D picture because with the improvements of the echocardiography, you can get 3D pictures and you can see the vegetation sitting there in the valves. And that is the mural endocarditis with the endocardium alone being involved with endocarditis vegetations there. And you have non-bacterial endocarditis, they're called merantic endocarditis with the endocarditis vegetation sitting under the well. Now coming to the prophylaxis, what is changing, what is happening? This has been all started in the penicillin era. The American Heart Association came up with some guidelines and because diagnosing and treating endocarditis is all observational. We haven't got any prospective randomized trials or even any human studies which are pros prospectively conducted, which is showing that the benefit of treating patients with endocarditis is going to be saving lives. And then later, it was again revised by the European Society of Cardiology people with a task force, and they came up with revision of recommendations. The incidence of transient bacteremia is normally high with the normal routine dental activities like brushing, flossing, even in normal people, and much more so in patients with poor oral hygiene, and this increases the risk in patients with any cardiac conditions. And talking about the risk and benefits of treating any patients with antibiotics, the risk is more than the benefit. As I told earlier, the number needed to treat to prevent one patient from endocarditis in a normal general population is 1 in 14 million compared to 1 in 95,000 patients with cardiac problems. The risks are more with antibiotic resistance developing and also anaphylaxis and other issues and cost effectiveness as well. So there is no clear-cut randomized control trials or human trials to show a good evidence of the efficacy of treating patients for endocarditis. So based on the clinical evidence in this day and era, we haven't got any class one evidence. It's all class two evidences. And from the level of evidence itself, it's all the consensus opinion. We haven't got any randomized control trials. From there, with the poor existing evidence, we need to treat only patients with high risk and here the limitations are indicated. And what they recommend is a good oral hygiene with twice a year regular dental checkup and maintaining a good oral hygiene is more enough for patients with high risk. What are the high risk cardiac conditions then? Previous infective endocarditis, patients with a prosthetic heart wall, patients with congenital heart disease, unrepaired cyanotic congenital heart disease, a completely repaired congenital cyanotic heart disease less than six months, repaired congenital heart disease with residual defects, 
a cardiac transplant patient with any valvuloplasty. And what are the recommendations? They say it is definitely recommended with a high level of evidence of 2A and level of evidence of C for manipulation of the gingival, periapical region, and the mucosa alone, where it is not indicated or it's not recommended for any of the respiratory, gastrointestinal, urological, or and skin or soft tissue lesions for elective procedures. What is the antibiotic recommendation they're saying? We take into two groups, patients who can take orally or patients who can take parenterally. Patients who can take orally, we can just stick on to amoxicillin. Who can't take orally, we have to switch on to ampicillin. If they, can't, if they are not able to take ampicillin, they can go to kefazolin and kefiroxin. If they're allergic to penicillin, then you go to keflexin, clindamycin, or azithromycin, or clarithromycin, macrolide antibiotics, you can give intravenously. Or if they can, can't take orally, then you go for parental administration. That is the latest recommendation from the American Heart Association. What is the role of echocardiography now? With the invent of and advances in technology of echocardiography, transthoracic and transesophageal has been included in the early 90s by the Duke group. It's helping for diagnosis, treatment, and management, and follow-up. With any patient with new murmur or embolism or any clinical signs of fever or heart failure, it can be repeated every seven to 10 days because it's non-invasive. It can diagnose vegetations and abscesses. It can be done intraoperatively and also to do cardiac evaluation after completion of therapy. You have a protocol which you can follow. If you suspect an infective endocarditis, you can do a transthoracic or transesophageal echocardiography. And there are various definitions about the anatomic and echocardiac presentations. And I'll show you a couple of clips. These are the two pictures of a still image of a vegetation in the aortic valve. And that is the apical four-chamber view with the mitral valve vegetation and the mitral valve abscess and perforation with the regurgitation. And you have these endocarditis lesions in the aortic valve. And with that is, you've got a new regurgitant murmur going back. And you have vegetation in the mitral valve or the, sorry, the aortic valve, <coughs> and you have the explained picture. You have the abscess there, root abscess, and you can see the lesions with regurgitation there. And you can see another vegetation there. At the tricuspidal vegetation, a patient with IVDU, and you can see tricuspidal regurgitation as well. That's the regurgitation. So there are special clinical situations you need to think about in patients with pregnancy, elderly patients, congenital heart disease patients, right-sided IE in patients with ICDs, with the central lines, and patients with cardiac devices related to infective endocarditis and prosthetic valve. So let's get a case scenario. A 24-year-old primary coming for an emergency cesarean section. She had an ASD closure done percutaneously by umbrella device. So you've got a history of heart murmur, diagnosed with mitral valve prolapse. Does this patient need prophylaxis? Yes. How many people say yes? How many people say no? Yeah. This patient doesn't need one because she's primary, more than six months. She had an ASD closure done with an umbrella device. She doesn't need one. So the key points here, varying clinical presentations you need to remember, identify high-risk patients as mentioned earlier, antibiotic prophylaxis regime, which is very simple and easy to follow, timely diagnosis and treatment will save patients and life and the longevity, utility of toe and TEE is very easy, and you think about the clinical situations, and more importantly, improved access to dental care and treatment is going to save lives. Oral health. Thank you. The world now. Time stands now. Okay, we're going to the next lecture. I'd like to make an announcement.
announcement that we make a small alteration in this. The pre-launch, this would be the last talk. We will just carry on the next talk after lunch because I'm sure that you're all hungry. Uh, so after this talk, it's going to be lunch break, but also with the promise that you're going to return back in 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Next. Yeah. The question is going to be asked by the way by the time starts now. <laughs> so we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we go on to Dr. Satish. Yeah. The next talk is by Dr. Satish, Satish Kulkarni on the silent killer hypothermia. He is presently the consultant anesthetist at Leelavati Hospital, Mumbai. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Bala. I'm going to talk about hypothermia as a silent killer. So basically what I'm going to do is going to talk about what does hypothermia mean, uh, what sort of consequences it can have in the perioperative period, especially what we are interested in. And if the time permits, I'm going to talk a little bit more about prevention and issues which have come up recently. So let's get on with the talk. And what I mean is I'm going to talk about mild perioperative hypothermia. Now what do you mean by perioperative mild perioperative? One, when you talk about hypothermia, I'm not going to talk about surface hypothermia or peripheral temperature. It's going to be about core, core temperature. And when I mean by the core temperature, core temperature means is the temperature of the deep tissues of the body, which is extremely necessary for the optimal function of the tissue enzymes, which are extremely sensitive to temperature changes. Human beings, as well as some birds and mammals are homeothermic, which means that any change in the core temperature would initiate behavioral and physiological changes which will get back the temperature to the near normal range. And what is the normal range of the core temperature is about 36.5 to 37.5. Now there are a lot of issues about this what exactly is core temperature because this so called data has been originated 140 of, in 1800 from a single worker Karl Wunderlich from Germany that what you mentioned this is and this has been debated whether actually because I am each patient the moment I give propofol, atracurium and uh, whenever we are going to intubate, first thing it goes is that a rise sweep goes in, the temperature probe goes in the distal esophagus and then the endotical tube. And next minute, the way I look at the entire carbon dioxide, I look at the temperature. And most of the times it will, you will be surprised to find 35.8, 35.6. I have seen up to 35.5 as a first temperature within uh, one minute of induction. So that is one. I am not going to talk about long cases like cardiac cases, pediatric cases, which probably all of them do monitor temperature. What I am going to talk about is short cases about an hour duration where it is going to be very important because the way the pattern of hypothermia in the perioperative period. In first 15 minutes to half an hour, there is a massive drop of temperature by 1 to 2 degrees centigrade in the core because of the various reasons and it does take a long time to come up. So by the time you are at the time of reversal, your core temperature is much lower, which has got a lot of complications and consequences. So before, so let's look at the, now perioperative cardiac events is the major unanticipated morbidity and mortality in the perioperative period. It has got high mortality as well. This data by Frank and SM in, two, in JAMA 1990s, it says that perioperative hypothermia triple the incidence of adverse myocardial events in high risk patients. There was a randomized control trial, 300 patients, coronary artery disease patients coming for major non-cardiac surgery. And what they noted was there was over three times increased incidence of arrhythmias, ventricular tachycardias, ventricular arrhythmias, myocardial ischemia and infarctions. Uh, another study which was in 2003 said intraoperative normative attenuates myocardial injury during bypass as reflected by reduced levels cardiac troponin. And there are various other studies done in gynae, orthopedic, uh, vascular, cardiac and all these things which has probably all of them have higher incidence as well. Now what could be the mechanism? When I trained I was always told that in a high risk individual if there is normal uh, hypothermia they will probably shiver and that would increase sympathetic stimulation, there would be hypertension, tachycardia, increased oxygen consumption, increased respiratory rate and in a patient who is high risk may not be able to compensate for the increase in the oxygen demand 
and probably they would ischemic hand have uh, myocardial ischemia and infarction in the periodic period. However, that doesn't seem to be true because high risk patients and elderly patients rarely shiver. Elderly patients will have diminished your thermoregulatory controls, so they rarely shiver. Intraoperative, normally most of the opiates will reduce the shivering, hypoxemia reduces the shivering or suppresses shivering and oxygen consumption which I was told has increased by 400 percent. It is never true in extreme conditions in young fit athletes, it never goes above 200 percent at best. So in the perioperative period, the likelihood of oxygen consumption going so high to actually cause ischemia seems to be unlikely. So shivering doesn't seem to be the main cause. What it could probably is a cold induced hypertension. It has been shown that if cold induced sympathetic stimulant hypertension, especially in the elderly and high risk patients, the noradrenaline levels are almost three times higher than normal thermic patients. Adrenaline levels does not seem to be that high and this increase in the noradrenaline levels probably give rise to hypertension, cardiac irritability, arrhythmias and causes probably increase in the. So this hypo, hypothermia per se is independent factor causing increased incidence of perioperative cardiac morbidity. Second, coagulopathy. Uh, there is the there is a lot of data basically show that if the patients are hypothermic, there is increased incidence of bleeding. This mild analysis, all these are all randomized controlled trials. Mild intraoperative hypothermia increases blood loss in allogenic trans requiring total hepatoplasty. Their estimate of the two unit transfusions were higher in by just one degree decrease in the core temperature. The core temperature going to 35 degrees. There was higher incidence of blood transfusions in those patients. The same data was repeated by aggressive warming and reducing blood loss during hip arthroplasty. They also noted that blood loss was more and probably the chance of infusion or transfusion requirements is much higher. There were a lot of studies done in various other surgeries as well. There were orthopedics, gynae, uh, vascular surgery. So Raj Gopalan in about 2008, they had a meta-analysis about the effect of about mild hypothermia and blood loss. And what they noted was the blood loss was overall in most of the surgeries increased by about 16 to 80, 20 percent. And the relative risk of a transfusion requirement is about 22 percent. Now, in recent data about blood transfusions and increased risk, apart from the known risk of infections and everything, there is huge data about immunodepression which causes blood transfusion and probably of cancer recurrence X, Y, Z. So that is what uh, that is what it is more concerned. It is a significant that if you can avoid allogenic transfusions, uh, that would be safer. Uh, in in reducing blood loss following spine surgery. But however, this, this group did not, did not find much difference. However, the patient data was very small, the numbers were very small, there were only 70 patients that looked of various factors towards spine surgery which would probably reduce blood loss and normothermia did not come as a major cause. They do not know why in those spine patients only normothermia, whether it was a technique or whether it is that specially 70 patient group was an issue. And in the recent this February anesthesiology, this fact 2015. They looked at intraoperative warming devices and the effect of blood transfusions and they noted that increased incidence of transfusions required which is which is significant. Hospitalization does increase uh, following these but, but uh, hospital duration but the is increase in the transfusions was significant. Why this would occur probably? Because platelet count, these are the various factors probably of hypothermia on these issues, platelets. Now we look at the counts, the counts do remain normal, however there are morphological changes in the platelets which increase the aggregation of platelets which is in contrast to our thinking that the platelet function will be depressed. Uh, in vitro if you see there is increased binding of the platelets. So the probably the cause is not the intrinsic problem with the platelets or the platelet function but they have been shown that availability of platelet activators does reduce and there is a, there is a release of heparin like anticoagulant substance level with the mild 1 degree decrease in the temperature. That, uh, if you look at the clotting factors the PTPTT seems to be normal if you do the test. However, all these tests are th done at 37 degrees centigrade. So if you do those same tests at actual cold temperature of the patients, probably you will find a difference. And all the enzyme systems in the coagulation cascade are extremely sensitive to temperature and they, the pro, there will be prolongation of prothrombin time as well as PTT. Fibrolytic activity which has got a good balance between clot formation and lysis. The clot formation like the plasminogen enzyme is extremely sensitive and it could have effect on the fibrolytic activity as well. However, that, however, the studies have not shown a great importance as of the fibrocysting in cause of wound healing and infection is a major complications of any major surgery. It has got implications as far as the cost, hospitalization and discomfort to the patients. 
uh, in colonic surgery perioperative normotheria it did reduce the incidence of or increase the incidence of uh, uh, surgical site infection in colon surgery patients by almost 3 times normal uh, reported incidence about 6% in patients who are hypothermic intraoperatively the incidence was almost about 20% and the uh, increase in the hospital stay was more than a week obviously it has got a lot of cost implication if the patient is going to stay in the hospital for one week apart from morbidity mortality as well and uh, similar sort of uh, these things by pre-warning they did manage to show that does reduce the incidence of infections. Hypothermia does decrease the wound healing as well as the various mechanism probably the scar formation, the collagen mobilization everything is reduced and the wound healing. Both these things will have implications as far as the hospital stay cost and your ICU stay and the, pro, uh, and the cost as well. Why this occurs probably because hypothermia causes subcutaneous vasoconstriction, there is hypoperfusion, decrease subcutaneous tissue oxygenation and neutrophil migration, all those things including, including suppression of the immune response. So all these things which have been factors in the first 4 hours following surgery what you, uh, uh, your infection sets in and that is the reason in this paper about anesthesia role and prevent surgical site infections. They have highlighted the role of uh, normotheria in the immediate post operative period. Uh, and as well as the about the antibiotic prophylaxis in the perioperative period. Apart from that, it is very obvious that you know it delays post anesthesia recovery. Most of our induction agents, inhalation agents are um, uh, you know induction agents are metabolized by the enzyme systems in the liver. If uh, uh, as far as the induction agents goes, your propofol concentrations are much higher in the blood in normal thermic patients when you use total intravenous anesthesia, fentanyl infusions at steady state uh, infusions are higher. Inhalations are much more soluble at, at lower temperatures. The way I look at it is if you like it, if the Coke or a Pepsi, if you eat in the fridge, you know you do not get the fizz. The moment it is an outside, you open the bottle and all the gas comes out is something. So all these agents are highly soluble in blood at lower temperatures, which does cause delayed in the recovery. Muscle relaxants, atopurum also. Uh, the duration is increased. However, vecuronium and rocuronium are much higher, almost double the time by one, one, one or two degrees decrease in the core temperature. Atracurium increases barely by 50 percent. And obviously, the reversal agents, those also, this thing, you can you can really see that when the temperature is 37 at at core temperature, the patients, uh, the patient, the recoveries are so clear-headed recoveries that you just need to appreciate the quality of recoveries when they are normothermic. And obviously, delayed recovery of uh, this thing will have implications as far as uh, your recovery stay as well. This is very obvious. Hypothermia increases the thermos input. You see a patient who is shivering in the is shivering in the recovery room, and you realize that apart from the physiological, that type of tachycardia, hypertension, and X Y Z, and the discomfort, it's interface in the in the you are monitoring as well. Your pulse oximeter, your NIB, nothing works if the patient is shivering rigorously, and. If you look at the satisfaction surveys and what you look at the these things, what patients rate identify feeling cold in the immediate post operative the worst part of the hospitalization, sometimes a rating worse than surgical pain as well. And given all the efforts to reduce the surgical pain in the post operative periods, I think you should have go all the out way, all out to basically make sure the patients are normotheric and they are comfortable. So because of these complications, various authorities and bodies have prompted recommendations for monitoring and warming strategies to maintain intra and post operative temperature of at least 36 degrees centigrade uh, in the this is what I am telling cold temperature. So that is the reason most of the machines do have temperature. Still I see most of all my colleagues and lot of people do not monitor temperature intraoperatively and if you monitor that is the only way you will be able to document the problem and look at the pro how you could treat it and improve it. Thank you very much.